Um, I think I should just say before I start that um, if we gave certificate ratings to our public lectures, uh, this lecture would be a 18 only or X rated, just to, uh, just to warn you. Okay. So in around 1520 in Rome, the artist Giulio Romano drew a series of erotic images of men and women having sex in a variety of explicit and sometimes quite acrobatic positions. These drawings were engraved by the printmaker, Mark Antonio Romondi, and were printed as a book in 1524. The book circulated amongst the Roman elite until Pope Clement VII, Giulio de' Medici, got to hear of it. The Vatican ordered the book to be burnt. All copies were apparently destroyed, and the Catholic Church imposed a death sentence on anyone reprinting it. Raimondi himself was thrown into prison. And the fragments that you might be able to see here um, are from the second edition, which I'm going to go on to talk about, which are now in the British Library. Okay, so a second edition was printed in Venice in 1527. And though the Pope tried to have this burnt as well, the book escaped and was circulated. Importantly, this second edition didn't only contain the engravings, but Pietro Aretino added a set of sexually explicit sonnets to accompany each picture. Now, what you're seeing here is on the left, you'll see a page uh, from the second edition, um, the engraving at the top and the sonnet inscribed beneath. Um, because, the, um, because it's not very easy to get a, an accurate uh, visual display, what I'm showing you on the right is actually a illustration from an 18th century recreation, which was based on that second edition, possibly by somebody called Agostino Caracci. Now, as an aside, the 18th century appears to be more interested in the visual images than in the text, although there was at least one 18th century edition that reprinted Aretino's sonnets as well. Um, in looking at that 18th century illustration, it's worth noting, noticing the classicizing features. So things like the classical drapery that we can see around the outside um, and the herms, those, uh, those torso statues, particularly associated with 5th century Athens. Now, one of the important things about this book was that the authors, and I'm using that term in its widest sense, so including the artists, were all well-educated and well-known artists. Giulio Romano had been apprenticed to Raphael, he'd studied classical art and architecture, and he'd worked on projects at the Vatican and at the Villa Francina in Rome. He's additionally famous for being the only contemporary artist to be mentioned in Shakespeare, where he's credited with creating the so-called statue of Hermione in The Winter's Tale, where he's described as that rare Italian master, Giulio Romano. Marc Antonio Romondi was also um, renowned. He was renowned as an engraver who'd also worked with Raphael. Um, and what you can see here is his engraving of a Hellenistic statue of Lycoon, derived from a scene in the Aeneid. Now, Aretino's sonnets are known as the Sonetti Lesuriosi, the lustful sonnets. And we'll see precisely why when we come to look at them in just a moment. And this second edition of 1527 was also given a title, the Modi, the positions or the postures. The title probably comes from Ovid's Ars Amatoria, his tongue-in-cheek manual of seduction, which includes in book three, a rehearsal of various sexual positions which can be adopted by women in order to show off their best physical features. Ovid's text describes these positions as Mile Modi Veneris, a thousand positions of love. As well as Ovid, scholars have suggested that Aretino and his artist colleagues were drawing on the concept of ancient sex manuals, um, an idea which fascinated Renaissance readers and which they'd heard about from various classical texts, including Suetonius's Life of Tiberius. So Suetonius here, talking about Tiberius and Capri, says that he has a number of small rooms which were furnished with the most indecent pictures and statuary available. Also, certain erotic manuals from Elephantus in Egypt. 
Now, Alephantis was a female courtesan, a poet, and possibly also a midwife um, from Hellenistic Egypt from around the first century BCE. And although none of her works have survived, they are mentioned in other classical texts, such as the Priapia poems, which were still erroneously attributed to Virgil at the point at which Aretino was writing. And in Marshall, um, in Epigrams 12 and 43, for example, where her books are described as mollus, literally soft, which is also often used as a code in Latin to imply debauched or immoral. The text of Marshall's Epigram 43 is disputed, so might read either as Veneris Novi Figurae, new positions of love, or as Veneris Novum Figurae, nine positions of love. The latter, of course, linking nicely to both Ovid with his exaggerated thousand positions of love and Aretino. Um, and Aretino's book was sometimes given a title, a subtitle, um, The 16 Positions. Okay, so let's have a look at a couple of Aretino's sonnets. Um, I won't read this out, um, but it's easy to see the gusto with which the text advertises its own gleeful crudity. It's worth saying here that modern English translations are still coy about Aretino's lewd language. Both Lynn Lorna, who did a popular translation in 1988, and Betty Talbaccio, who did a more scholarly translation in 1999, struggle with how to articulate the obscene language deliberately used by Aretino. Lorna puts the dirty words into Latin as if to obscure them, um, and I should just kind of uh, remind everybody here that Aretino was writing in the vernacular in Italian. Um, Talvaccio makes them much milder, giving them a sort of saucy or, <clears throat> or smutty register. So for these modern translators, Aretino's text remains problematic. <clears throat> Aretino's adopted literary form is also significant. Love sonnets in the Renaissance are associated especially with Petrarch, and to a lesser extent with Dante, two of the established pillars of Italian literature at the time, with Boccaccio as the third. Now, both Petrarch and Dante wrote of a very chaste, um, almost ethereal, kind of angelic love. Aretino is thus placing his text in an antagonistic relationship um, to both Petrarch and Dante, both in terms of the content and also by writing over their very refined and elegant use of the Italian language with his deliberately coarse diction and extensive use of street language. So what Aretino is doing is transgressive then in all kinds of ways. Not only is he defying the authority of the Pope and the Catholic Church, but he's also challenging the national literary cultural heritage of Petrarchan and Dantean love. And he's expressing these contraventions via erotic poetry. He even distorts the sonnet form itself, creating 16 line poems rather than the conventional 14 lines. And if anybody knows of any other 16 line sonnets, I'd certainly be very interested um, to hear about them. Okay, so this is a, a second uh, sonnet from Aretino. Um, and as I said, you can see the, the page layout, which is the same with all, through all of the leaves, um, the drawing at the top and the inscribed sonnet beneath. Now the poems are frequently based on the imagined speeches that take place between the people in the images. And another point worth noting here is the dual voices that Aretino uses. So while the sonnets of Petrarch, for example, are articulated almost exclusively through a male voice, Aretinos are often dialogues between both partners, making prominent use of female voices as both active participants in the text and in the act being depicted. But it's the woman speaking is made quite clear in this poem from its opening lines. Now, some of the women um, in the poems are named and are well-known courtesans or high-class prostitutes. So for example, Laurencina and Chabatina make an appearance in Sonnet 7. Both of them were prostitutes active in Roman political circles, but also pointedly, I think, in papal circles as well. There's also a mention of Rangoni, a very well-known soldier in the service of the Este family of Ferrara, 
um, in Sonnet 12. The sonnets then can be read as provocative commentary on contemporary Italian, primarily Roman life, and the circulation of power that structures society. Incorporating courtesans, well known to be connected to the papal court, may well have been a deliberate response to the Pope's destruction of the first edition of this work. Uh, that's just a close up for anybody who couldn't read uh, the whole sonnet. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Clearly, the accompanying engravings don't participate in the more usual loves of the gods typology, which serves to give a classicizing veneer of respectability to erotic paintings and sculpture of this period. Um, and I just put two examples on here out of many that I could have chosen. <clears throat> the first one is uh, Titian's The Nye, um, and we can see that that uh, female nude absolutely in the foreground um, of the painting. And Bernini's beautiful Apollo and Daphne, I might not have, have captured quite the right angle for that. Um, a very interesting uh, myth, which is about a sexual pursuit near rape um, and Daphne who escapes just at the right moment by turning into a uh, uh, laurel tree. Now it's also well recognized that much of the erotic visual art of the Renaissance derives from classical myth, frequently from stories known from Ovid's Metamorphoses, as well as Ovid's Herodes and Fasti. The engravings in the Modi deliberately turn away from this form of culturally acceptable eroticism and mark their devi deviation by depicting ordinary men and women, possibly courtesans as we've seen, having sex. Now, before going on to look at receptions of Aratino's book, it's worth just pausing here to consider the vocabulary that we've been using. Erotic is a notoriously difficult term to pin down, whether as a description or as a critical term. So the Oxford English Dictionary gives us of or pertaining to the passion of love, concerned with or treating of love, amatory. And Ian Moulton, in his wonderful book Before Pornography, uh, defines it as the representation of sexual acts and goes on to say, uh, or to define erotic writing as referring to any text, regardless of genre or literary quality, that deals in a fundamental way with human physical sexual activity. Now, what is deemed erotic in literature, as in life, is relative and subjective. It's also shaped by and understood through historicized cultural and aesthetic norms. Distinctions between what is defined as erotic, pornographic, or sexually explicit are difficult to delineate and tricky to enforce. And it's worth looking here at how the 16th century deals with this thorny issue. The word erotica did not come into English usage until remarkably late, 1854. Even the word erotic was not used in English until 1668, although the derivative Erotic curl is used slightly earlier in 1621 in Richard Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. Instead, as we'll see in a moment, terms such as wanton, lascivious, even scurrilous are used by early modern writers to indicate the presence of problematic erotic material. So how did contemporary Renaissance readers respond to Aretino's book? Luckily, we have a near contemporary account of the creation of the Modi in Vasari's Life of Giulio Romano, which was published in 1550. He explains, Giulio Romano had Marc Antonio engraved in 20 sheets the same number of different positions, attitudes, and postures in which immoral men lie with women. And what was worse, for each position, Messer Pietro Aretino created a most obscene sonnet. Now it's worth noting here that Vasari is talking about 20 sheets. Um, there are only 16, 16 that are extant. Um, and as I said, some of the uh, subtitles of that second edition uh, are actually called the 16 postures. Um, so it's not, it's not quite sure whether this is an error um, or whether there were some other sheets that, uh, that Vasari uh, saw at the time or whether he's confusing the second edition with the destroyed first edition. 
We're just not quite sure. Um, he draws attention here to the immoral men depicted in the engravings, but doesn't mention the named courtesans um, who were active, as we've just seen, at the papal court. So he might well have expected his audience to be aware of that fact. And interestingly, he also says, but what was worse for each position, Messer Pietro Artino created the most obscene sonnet, the sonnet somehow outweighed the engravings in terms of obscenity, at least for Vasari. We can find other contemporary responses to Artino. Ludovico Ariosto, writing in 1529, just two years after the publication of the Modi, and most famous himself for his Orlando Furioso, the first edition of which was printed in 1516, and which was itself notably erotic, had this to say. My suppositions are entirely different from those ancient ones Elephantus painted, which have recently been revived in our city of Holy Rome, beautifully but shamefully printed up so that the whole world can read them. Now Ariosto's supposition was a bawdy play, first staged in 1509, where a man swaps place with a manservant in order to woo the daughter of the house, a well-used trope in Renaissance drama, of course, that has its origins in Roman comedy. Ariosto is right though, the playful erotic nature of his play is quite different from the deliberate obscenity of Aretino. It's worth noting here the mention again of Elephantus, um, the misunderstanding that she was a painter rather than a poet, and the connection to the Modi, which combines drawings and text. It's also worth noting um, that quotation, which I've also used for the title of this talk, beautifully but shamefully printed up. It's a testament, it seems, to the tension that might spring from erotic books in this period. There's an, ad, there's an admirable artistic workmanship about the art and about the printing that seems to give rise to a pleasure which is also akin to shame, at least that is in public discourse. We also, luckily, have Aretino's own account of the affair. In a letter that he wrote to Battista Zatti, he explains how he came to write these sonnets. After I arranged for Pope Clement to release Mark Antonio of Bologna, who was imprisoned for having engraved on copper the 16 positions, so here he talks about 16, I desired to see those figures which had driven Ghiberti and his followers to cry out that the virtuosic artist who had conceived them should be crucified. As soon as I gazed on them, I was filled with the same spirit that had moved Giulio Romano to draw them. And since ancient and modern poets and sculptors, in order to exercise their minds in a pleasant manner, sometimes composed and carved lascivious objects, such as the marble satyr and Palazzo Chigi, attempting to rape a little boy, I tossed off the sonnets which are to be seen below. With all due respect, hypocrites, I dedicate these lustful pieces to you, heedless of fake prudishness and asinine prejudices that forbid the eyes to gaze at the things they most delight to see. Now there's lots of interesting unpacking that we can do with this. Um, firstly, that Aretino was drawn into the affair before he'd even seen the engravings. His impulse seems to be prompted by indignation at the fact of Mark Antonio's imprisonment. It's only after he's played whatever role he plays in the artist's release, does he then see the engravings. I desired to see those figures. Secondly, that some artists, namely Ghiberti and his followers, imply that the virtuosic artist is also to be a moral artist. Aretino implicitly disagrees and assumes that Romano does too. As he says, as soon as I gazed on them, I was filled with the same spirit that he knew Giulio Romano to draw them. In fact, it's seeing the engravings which prompts the creation of the sonnets. Aretino wants to add his voice to the message already being articulated by the artists. He's prompted to write against the authoritative policing of the original engravings by the Pope and against prevailing moralistic discourses about art itself. His sonnets, however obscene, have thoughtful, even ideological purpose behind them. Thirdly, there's recourse here to the conventional argument 
that ancient or classical poets and sculptors are recognized as erotic precedents and might be used to justify the lascivious or the implicitly immoral in art and literature. And we'll return to this point in just a moment. Overall then, Aretino is self-consciously and quite deliberately using the erotic, these lustful pieces or poems to intervene in cultural debates and to make a politicized stand. The erotic or pornographic nature of this book isn't merely something to delight, but might also, uh, but is also something which has to be actively read, actively contextualized and interpreted. In. We might even see it almost as a kind of artistic manifesto. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Aretino himself. He was already known as a writer of satirical poetry and lampoons before his sonnets were published, and had been particularly associated with Pasquinato, political satires aimed specifically at the papal court. This led to Ariosto, who we met a few slides earlier, to describe him as the divine Pietro Aretino, scourge of princes. Now, significantly, Aretino was a self-supporting writer. He was in debt to no patron. And this self-sufficiency allowed extensive freedom of expression. He himself says, I hope my book will be like the scalpel, at once cruel and merciful, with which the good doctor cuts off the sick limb so that the others remain healthy. Now, this is from his preface uh, to his Regulamentum, a series of dialogues between two Roman prostitutes, and which, amongst other things, offers up a hilarious parody of the poor of the Aeneid, the story of Dahil and Aeneas. Not surprisingly, all of Aretino's works were placed, were placed on the papal index as forbidden books. Now, before moving on to look at Aretino in England, I just want to pick up on that earlier point about the erotic being legitimated by classical art and texts. We've noted classicizing elements in the engravings, as well as Aretino's direct reference to ancient poets and sculptors in the Zatti letter. Now, Roman Augustan visual and textual culture, and I've chosen Augustan Rome here because of the importance of Ovid, uh, who we'll talk about in a bit more as we uh, go on. Um, Augustan culture was undoubtedly steeped in sexually explicit images in both the public and in private contexts. So we find them on the walls of public bathhouses, on cups, engraved into gemstones, on mirrors, on lamps, and in coins. Um, and there's also an interesting negotiation that takes place in Augustan poetry, which we'll see in a moment. And the images that I'm showing you here are uh, Pompeian frescoes um, and a, a coin uh, in, the, in the corner. Now the frescoes are from brothels um, and may well have served as kind of menu cards um, so that non-Latin speakers or tourists uh, could simply point to what they wanted uh, when they went into the brothel. Okay, so Ovid's Amores 1.5 offers an example of an Augustan text that seems to be testing the limits of how far it can go. It's quite happy to depict the details of a woman's naked body. As she stood before my eyes with drapery laid aside, nowhere on all her body was sign of thought. What shoulders, what arms did I see and touch? How suited for gripping is the form of her breasts? How smooth her body beneath the faultless bosom, what a long and beautiful side, how youthfully fair a thigh. But when it comes to the crunch point, the text coyly looks away. Who does not know the rest? So again, we can see here that Aretino might claim a Vidian commission for his lustful sonnets, but he presses quite insistently on the boundaries between the erotic and the more transgressively obscene. He goes much further than the classical poetry, which he uses to legitimize his own. So moving forward into 16th century England, Aretino has been called the most notorious figure of Italianate eroticism in Tudor Stuart England. His sonnets and the accompanying engravings were widely known in England, though sadly there's no extant evidence of a copy being owned in the country. There are, however, rumours that William Cecil, um, the very earnest Lord Burley and Elizabeth I's uh, chief advisor, 
owned a copy and I'm really hoping that a historian, a book historian somewhere finds um, this very serious man uh, with a copy of this pornography. Um, we can though find lots of evidence and knowledge of Aretino, his sonnet and his reputation. So uh, Edmund Spencer, for example, in The Shepherd's Calendar writes, but yet no man think that herein I stand with Lucian or his devilish disciple Aretino in defense of execrable and horrible sins of forbidden and unlawful fleshliness. Um, and a little bit later, John Donne in one of his satires writes, Aretino's pictures have made me chaste. And again, here we have this sort of slight uh, sort of blurring between Aretino's sonnet um, and the engravings, which are part of the same book. Um, even if we don't find extant copies um, of the Imodi in England, um, elite and coffee readers in England were, of course, completely conversant with Italian and were accustomed to buying European books, which they brought back with them. We have letters, for example, from Philip Sidney detailing his book buying sprees while he's traveling throughout Europe. It's also worth saying here that while Spencer is ostensibly separating himself um, from Aretino, He's clearly very familiar with the text in order to describe it in such lurid detail, execrable and horrible sins of forbidden and unlawful fleshliness. Now we're going to look presently at a poet who was known as England's Aretino. But before that, I'd just like to go back to some of the questions raised in Aretino's letter about art, morality, and the erotic, and look at them in relation to English poetry books. Now, a critical orthodoxy um, of the period and of many scholars who write about this period is that literature and poetry should teach and delight an often quoted formulation taken from Philip Sidney's defense of poesy. So for example, Sir Thomas Eliot said, Homer shows not only the documents martial and discipline of arms, but also incomparable wisdoms and instruction for politic governance of people. Edmund Spencer again, um, in a letter which prefaced uh, the Fairy Queen. The general end, therefore, of all the book is to fashion a gentleman or noble person in virtuous and gentle discipline. And George Putnam, in his The Art of English Poesy, asserts that poetry should concern itself with the praise of virtue and reproof of vice, the instruction of moral doctrine. Now this more or less general consensus derived from the literature of the period has led Brian Vickers amongst others to assert that a coherent theory of literature existed in the Renaissance, which was derived from a commendation of virtue and condemnation of vice. Literature, he asserts, has a role, not just in the moral education of the individual, but also in creating a morally good society. The writers as diverse as Sidney and Hayward and Hobbes should celebrate the power of poetry and drama to arouse a love of virtue and a desire to emulate it. This further proof that Renaissance literary theory is perfectly coherent, being based on the union of rhetoric and ethics. Um, and I think that perfectly coherent rather leads to a, a bit of a postage to the fortune there. Um, because I think we need to say, or at least ask, if this is true, how do we account for the presence of so much erotic poetry in the English literature of the 16th century? And we may think here of Wyatt's love poetry written at the court of Henry VIII, Sidney's Astrophil and Stella, where the poet narrator pursues a married woman and only just holds himself back from raping her as she sleeps, um, Dunn's love elegy, Marlowe's hearing the hero in Leander, as well as his translation of Ovid's Amores, Shakespeare's sonnet, Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. It's significant too that so many of these, uh, so much of this erotic verse is not written by marginal poets, but by the absolutely canonical. If a central function of literature in the 16th century, as Vickers asserts, is to stimulate the reader to emulate its morals, then what are we to learn from erotic verse and love sonnets? It's certainly not as simple as saying, that the erotic poetry provides a negative example, that they reverse the moral direction and demonstrate bad behavior which we should avoid. The excellence of the poetry partly takes issue with that argument. So there do seem to be more complex premises 
which makes sense of this antithetical relationship between erotic poetry and the supposedly ethical role given to poetry in general. Reading the erotic becomes crucial to understanding what cultural work poetry might be doing in this period. Now, Sir John Harrington's preface to his translation of, of Ariosto's Orlando Furioso is a rich thought of framing this investigation as Harrington navigates his way through the tricky and sometimes contradictory issues surrounding the erotic in literature. In responding to poetry's detractors, he remarks, the last reproof is lightness and wantonness. This is indeed an objection of some importance, since as Sir Philip Sidney confesses, Cupid is crept even into the heroical poems and consequently maketh that also subject to that reproof. I promised in the beginning, not partially to praise poesy, but plainly and honestly to confess that that might truly be objected against it. And if anything may be, sure it is this lasciviousness. As for the pastoral, with the sonnet or epigram, though many times they savour of wantonness and love and toying, and now and then breaking the rules of poetry go into plain sterility, yet even the worst of them may not be ill applied, and are, I must confess, too delightful. Now, firstly, it's worth noting Harrington's language here, lightness, wantonness, lasciviousness, all terms which are associated with the idea of the erotic. The sonnet as a form is openly associated by Harrington with wantonness and love and toying, and interestingly, in breaking the rules of poetry as they embrace the scurrilous. Yet even though it might transgress these implied moral rules, this poetic form may still be too delightful, where the excess expressed in that too may even be attributed precisely to its illicit scurrility. Harrington's text that thus foregrounds a complicated, even contradictory, cultural response to the erotic and poetry books. On one hand, its frivolous, wanton, lascivious, thoroughness, qualities apparently to be disapproved of. On the other, it's the site of an eager and perhaps unruly readers and writers' pleasure. Going on to talk specifically about the Orlando Furioso and the lascivious in Ariosto, Harrington says, yea, methinks I see some of you searching already for these places on the book, and you are half offended that I've not made some directions that you might find and read them immediately. Now, this is a potent testimony, I think, to the popularity and appeal of the erotic in 16th century books, which counters the idea of readers solely perusing text for moral instruction. Indeed, according to Harrington, some readers would prefer to skim through all those serious bits and go straight to the lascivious bits and are just annoyed that he hasn't pointed out which ones they are. So the reason why Harrington's preface is so pertinent to our concerns today is that he foregrounds the spaces that open up between what is said about poetry and its moral aim and the actual practices adopted by Renaissance writers and readers. There might certainly exist a prescriptive moral view of literature that it should teach and delight, but in practice, that delight may well be cited, not in the virtuous, but in the wanton, in the frivolous, in the lascivious. And a quotation from Marshall, which is appropriated by Harrington in his preface, articulates some of the complexity that Renaissance readers and writers experience around literary eroticism and erotic books. Loud and Ila said Ista Legant. So they praise those, but these are the ones they read. The treatises, commentaries, prefaces, and defenses of poetry that abound in 16th century Europe tell a story, but not a complete one. Poetry may masquerade beneath the mask of morality, but its true delight may come from the way in which it opposes and undermines the ethical stance which allows it to exist and to be culturally valorized in the first place. One side of this tension between the prescriptive and the actual practice of writing and reading is erotic poetry books. <clears throat> now we can find various classical precedents for this use of the erotic to negotiate social and cultural positions. Aulus Gellius, 
was a Miscellanist writing in the second century CE. Um, his 20, 20 book, Noctis Atticae, The Attic Nights, contains extracts from a great number of Greek and Latin works. Um, the text was written in the second century CE. It's known in manuscript from the fifth century. And the first edition was printed in Rome in 1469. There was a second Roman edition and a Venetian edition, both in 1472, with the Venetian edition being reprinted 12 times before 1500. Venetius Aldus, one of the great Renaissance uh, book printers, classical works, published his, his edition in 1515. Now in book 19, there's a dinner party at which the guests are entertained by a group of young singers. They sang in a most charming way several odes of Anacreon and Sappho, as well as some erotic elegies of more recent poets that were sweet and graceful. One of the Greek guests suggests that Latin literature doesn't have such exquisite, charming or erotic poems. But another diner, a Roman, defends Latin literature, claiming that it too has poetry on lovers and Venus. Now in this debate, erotic verse is associated with cultural refinement and with an urban and urbane sophistication. And Catullus in that debate is deemed to be at least the equal of, if not the superior to, Anacreon and Sappho. So what we can see here is that the erotic and specifically erotic poetry is being used to negotiate the relationship between Greek and Roman culture. It becomes a form of cultural capital. Okay, now bearing all of these uh, points in mind, I want to skip forward now to the 1590s, um, the last trouble decade of Elizabeth's 45 year rule, and to, explain, uh, to explore a poem by Thomas Nash, sometimes known as England's Aretino, um, and specifically his bawdy poem called The Choice of Valentines. Some manuscript versions, of which there are four in the British Library, call it Nash's Dildo. So, spoiler alert already. Now, this is a poem which offers a, a long, it's about 350 lines, a very detailed, bawdy story of a sexual encounter between a young man named Tomlin and the prostitute Francis, with whom he was in love. And we get a vivid picture of Tomlin's sexual activity. He rubbed and pricked and pierced her to the bones, digging as far as he might the stones. Now high, now low, now striking short and thick, now diving deep, he touched her to the quick. Unfortunately, his over-enthusiasm proved short-lived. And with a plea, but what so firm that may continue ever, he's forced to bring the encounter to an unexpectedly rushed end. And despite his lover's entreaties that he continued, a Francis tries to help him with some manual stimulation. Unhappy me, quoth she, and will it not stand? Come, let me rub and shake it with my hand. Perhaps the silly worm is laboured sore and wearied that it can do no more. To no avail, alas. She's not, however, completely dependent on the untrustworthy male body. Uh, the faint-hearted instrument of lust, as she calls it. She has a substitute ready. My little dildo shall supply their kind, a knave that moves as light as leaves by wind, that bendeth, bendeth not nor foldeth any deal, but stands as stiff as he were made of steel, and plays at peacock twixt my legs right blithe, and doth my tickling swage with many a sigh. Behold how he usurps in bed and bath, and undermines thy kingdom every hour. Now this poem has generally dis been dismissed by critics as pornography and as unworthy of scholarly attentions. M.L. Stapleton, for example, is so concerned with not, quote, straining the boundaries of good taste that he refuses to even name the eponymous dildo, calling it instead an uh, autoerotic device. More recently though, uh, Will Fisher, Ian Moulton and Stephen Guy Bray have all revisited this text. And like them, I believe that it's as deserving of critical commentary as is, for example, the Baroque violence of Titus Andronicus. Now Nash, like Aretino, uses classical literature, specifically Ovid, as a precedent and defends his writing by saying, yet Ovid's wanton muse did not offend, he is the fountain whence my streams doth flow. 
There's also evidence that Nash's 16th century readers recognized his reliance on Aretino. Gabriel Harvey, for example, who had an ongoing and increasingly rabid literary feud with Nash, which played out publicly via a series of pamphlets, spat out, cannot an Italian ribald vomit out the infectious poison of the world, but an English horror laurel must lick it up for a restorative. Um, and anybody not familiar with 16th century slang, um, a horror is a debauchee and a laurel is a rogue. So a, a debauched rogue here is what he's calling uh, Nash. Now, all of Nash's books were ordered to be burned in the Bishop's Ban of 1599, but the choice of Valentine's hadn't been printed, it only existed in manuscript, and so it escaped that censorship. It continued to circulate in manuscript um, from around 1592, 1593, but it wasn't printed until 1899. Um, and then it was by a private gentleman's press, i.e. his Victorian pornography. But the question that I'd like to ask here is, is it merely pornography? however that might be defined? Or is there something more interesting that can be read into this poem alongside its undoubted entertainment value? Um, and as a sort of uh, leading up to answering that question, 1599 was not the first time that Nash had found himself in trouble with the authorities. In 1597, he'd written the first act of a play called The Isle of Dogs, and he left it with the, with the theatrical company Pembroke's Men, with whom he was working. Ben Johnson, the well-known playwright, completed the play, and it was performed for the first and only time in July 1597, before being instantly suppressed by the Privy Council at the request of the Lord Mayor and the Aldermen of the City of London. Ben Johnson was arrested um, and was thrown into the Marshalsea prison, uh, Nash's rooms were searched, and he only evaded prison by fleeing London for Norfolk. Now, sadly, this play was actually destroyed, but it seems to have been a political satire attacking the Elizabethan court and its institutions, such as the Privy Council. The instructions given by the Privy Council were to trace those responsible for this lewd play containing very seditious and scandalous matter and ensure that the lewd and mutinous behavior of the players be punished. When the case against Ben Johnson was heard on 15th of August, 1597, the play was again described in court as containing very seditious and scandalous matter. Now this indictment, which combines accusi accusations of lewdness in combination with sedition and mutiny, is suggestive of Nash's volatile relationship to political hierarchy, authority and the court of Elizabeth I, and might remind us of Aretino's contravention, paper authority we've already looked at. So can we read this, this subversion back into the choice of Valentine's? As is the case with Aretino sonnets, the, the uh, choice of Valentine's is an anti patriarchal poem. It moves away from the rarefied atmosphere of Petrarch's love by being set in a city brothel in London. However, the Petrarchan model also has an additional valency in England at this time, as it was used within Elizabeth's court to structure her relationships with male courtiers. They all paid lavish attention to her as their elusive and untouchable but beloved mistress. Given this specific English usage of Petrarchan discourse, challenging this scheme as Nash does by making Tomlin's mistress a knowing prostitute, can perhaps be read as both critical and also skeptical of Elizabeth and the power structures that she authorized. It's also the case that the empowerment of Francis in the poem, The Mistress Prostitute, is epit epitomized or fetishized by her dildo, is matched by or even dependent on the phallic failure of Tomlin. The dildo doesn't appear until after Francis has tried and failed to rouse Tomlin by hand. There's even a moment where she gloats on the downfall of poor Priapus, the embodiment of phallic masculinity, and his usurpation by her own portable form of masculinity, the dildo, which undermines thy kingdom. So in an era when to be a monarch was implicitly gendered masculine, 
This poem has extremely suggestive overtones, which belie its status as merely pornographic entertainment, though I think it certainly is that as well. It offers um, a comic image of male impotence or inadequacy in the face of a woman who can appropriate markers of masculinity to herself. As Francis points out, the dildo gives her all the pleasure with no fear of pregnancy. For by St. Runyon, he'll refresh, refresh me well and never make my tender belly swell. Um, now in 1593, when this poem is circulating, pregnancy is certainly a problematic concept in Elizabeth's case. Um, she was 60, well beyond childbearing age, obviously, creating a huge anxiety about the succession. Now we should be wary, of course, of reading Francis as merely a crude avatar for Elizabeth, but the poem does seem to be giving local expression to wider cultural anxieties about the rightful hierarchy of gender, which is especially potent given the presence of a long reign of female monarch on the English throne. So this is an erotic poem, but it's also one I'd suggest which bridges erotic and political discourse even perhaps breaking down easy distinctions between the two. Now there's another, this time very well-known poem that can be read productively alongside Mitch, especially in terms of the submerged Elizabethan consciousness that melds the erotic and the political, and that's John Dunn's To His Mistress Going to Bed. At first reading, this poem, which rewrites Ovid's Amore on Five, which has been described by John Carey and Arthur Marotti as a striptease poem, seems straightforwardly voyeuristic. It's spoken in a masculine voice as a man watches impatiently as his mistress undresses, drawing insistent attention to his own phallic readiness. The foe of times, having the foe in sight, is tired of standing, though they never fight. The fact tired implies both an eager sexual impatience and perhaps the possibility of an exhaustive detrumescence, recalling Nash's Tomlin and his usurpation by Francis. Dunn's narrator articulates a similar anxiety as he contemplates his mistress's bust, um, a stiffener placed within a bodice to give it shape. He says, off with that happy bust, which I envy, that still can be and still can stand so nigh. So even as he asserts a sense of masculine dominance and control in ordering his mistress to undress, he simultaneously compares himself to an object whose very nature is to be always erect, unlike his own phallic masculinity, which may become tired. Now, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about busts because they're fascinating. Um, the uh, illustration here is actually a 19th century whale uh, sorry, whalebone bust, um, which is beautifully engraved. I hope you can see some of that. Um, in the 16th century, uh, busks were not necessarily part of a bodice. They were separate objects which slipped into pockets sewn into the garment. In Dunn's poem, images of masculine potency contain within them insidious reminders of impotency, such as that ambiguous tire that we've already noted. The narrator tells us that he envies this happy bust because it can stand upright, even though it's close to his mistress's body. So it maintains its upright nature, while he fears that, like Nash's Tomlin, his own body might let him down in proximity to his mistress. But we can press this idea further. As Sandy Feinstein points out, the late 16th century busk and corset were thought to have the potential to make women look more like men as they served to flatten their breasts and stomach. It was also feared that they might act as a form of contraception, preventing women from getting pregnant because of the pressure on and restriction on their bodies, or even perhaps of bringing on abortions. The anxiety that this gave rise to was that the bus might promote female sexual promiscuity once women were free from the threat of pregnancy. The bus then, in this period, functions as a visual signifier of an adopted masculinity, as well as a cultural symbol for the threat of women appropriating masculine sexual morals. It's a subtle form of cross-dressing, 
that confuses the differentiation of male and female. It's no wonder then that Dunn's narrator exhorts off with that happy dust in an attempt to maintain sexual and cultural gender difference. Um, now, many of the iconic portraits of Elizabeth show us this bust silhouette that conceals the reality of the female body beneath a stylized representation. So in the ditchy portrait of Elizabeth on the left, we can see the queen's minute triangular torso where her breasts and especially stomach are visually squeezed out, overshadowed by the exaggerated sleeves and skirts. And as a comparison, we can see that the uh, portrait on the right of Philip Sidney is remarkably similar if we look at the triangular shape of the upper body and the waist. It's not only the bust bodice which links Dunn's poem to portraits of Elizabeth. The narrator describes her spangled breastplate, which he urges her to unpin. Um, this is a, an image of the or ermine portrait of Elizabeth with its spangled workings and again, that flat triangular torso. Okay, now I don't want to press this too far. Um, and I would say that it's, it's a suggestive rather than a confirmed connection. But it's worth briefly mentioning here, um, Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis is a pillion printed in 1593, while the playhouses were closed for play. Now, uh, this is another narrative that draws on Ovid's retelling of the Venus and Adonis episode in the Metamorphoses and features another prominent female character in the goddess Venus. And it's well known that, uh, that Venus in Shakespeare's poem um, is, a, is again a sort of avatar um, for Elizabeth. Um, Venus's dominance is established early in the poem and encoded through a comic largeness and strength. Being so enraged, desire to blend her thoughts courageously to pluck him from his horse. Over one arm, the lusty horse's rein, under her other was the tender boy. Now set against um, Aretino or even Natch, the poem is erotically insinuating rather than obscene as Venus tries to seduce the unpersuadable Adonis. Graze on my lips, she says, and if those hills be dry, stray lower where the pleasant fountains lie. More significantly, for the discourse of phallic femininity that we've been tracing, is Venus's response to Adonis's death. And nuzzling in his flank, the loving swine, she, unaware, the tusk in his soft groin. Had I been too like him, I must confess, with kissing him, I should have killed him first. So imagining a tusk of her own, Venus fantasizes penetrating Adonis, an act which leads not just to the impotence of Nash and Dunn's poems, but to the death of her would-be lover. Now Venus and Adonis has been described as schoolboy erotica by Emil Stapleton, as opposed to the obscenity of the choice of Valentine's. But there are striking commonalities between these three poems that we've looked at, the Nash, the Shakespeare, and the Dunn. Neither Nash nor Dunn's text can be dated with accuracy, but both have generally been attributed to around uh, 1593 and circulated in manuscript. Incidentally, Dunn's poems, uh, sorry, uh, when Dunn's poems were first published posthumously in 1633, to his mistress going to bed was excluded from that collection and wasn't actually printed until 1669 um, after the restoration. Venus and Adonis was printed in 1593 and became an Elizabethan bestseller. All three writers were in their twenties. Dunn and Nash had both studied at Cambridge. Dunn was finishing his education at Lincoln's Inn and the initial audience for both his and Nash's texts were likely to have been Inns of Court students. Young, male, well-educated, both aspiring towards social position and yet also asserting a sort of rebellious, cynical attitude towards the Elizabethan court and its courtier. And we can usefully recall here Nash's Isle of Dogs play that so nearly got him thrown into prison for sedition. All three poems, like Aretino, draw on Ovid, Amores 1 5, and particularly Amores 3 7, um, which is a, an impotence poem. Um, all feature female characters who are sexually active 
and associated with some kind of fetishized phallic object, the dildo, the bus, the tusk. All three texts can be suggestively contextualized against the 45 year reign of a female monarch. And all three writers would barely have known a time when Elizabeth wasn't on the throne. On the throne. All three conjure up visions of male impotence, whether the literal lack of phallic potency in Nash, the sublimated anxiety of Dunn's poem, or the more pervasive lack of manhood in Shakespeare's boyish Adonis, who is plucked from his horse, tucked under Venus's arm, and ultimately penetrated in the groin by a tusk which Venus wishes that she had owned. While Venus in Adonis is now regarded as erotic, but not pornographic, Pablo Moret, in a 2017 article, traces how it was regarded as profoundly indecent at the time of publication in 1593, and that that was part of its best-selling appeal. Okay, so to draw all of this together then, um, and I've just given you some gratuitous Aretino to, uh, to look at while I summarize here. Um, the texts that we've looked at are all acutely dependent on phallic models of power, and representations of penetration or the failure to penetrate are used to confirm or destabilize conventional hierarchies of gender, status, and authority. Fantasies of sex and power are enacted on, with, and through both male and female bodies, but not in a straightforward way. They don't make an uncomplicated textual exchange where the poetics of love are merely a coded way of talking about politics. It's also striking that both Aretino and Dunn's texts make explicit and implicit gestures towards visual culture. Aretino is inspired by censored engravings. Dunn's text makes less obvious, perhaps more subjective, intertext with portraits of a monarch on whom discourses of gender and sexuality, both positive and negative, were and continue to be censored. To conclude then, erotic books in the 16th century are about the erotic, they're about love, they're about desire, they're about sex. Yet at the same time, sexual or erotic love also offers a vocabulary which can be put to use to articulate and express issues and concerns about gender, about authority, about hierarchy, and about power. Easy distinctions that try to categorize the licit erotic and distinguish it from the illicit pornographic or obscene are difficult to delineate and perhaps even harder to uphold. And we should, of course, be wary of imposing our own cultural definitions retrospectively on the Renaissance, as I think has been the case with Nash up until now. We've seen briefly today how Aretino sonnets challenge the authority of the Pope and Church. Interestingly, both Aretino and Nash were the objects of state censorship, though equally both managed to evade it. They both also complicated literary traditions. Both drew on and authorized their writings via classical Latin, especially Ovidian models, and both took an oppositional stance to the dominance of Petrarchan love. They were as concerned with the politics of literature as something more overtly political. At the same time, we can see that the Renaissance period itself was both troubled by and yet oddly inspired by the slippery distinction between the playfully wanton and the dangerously obscene. It seems that it's precisely the associations between the erotic, the subversive and the transgressive that makes writing the erotic such a fruitful and risky enterprise. The point that I'd like to leave you with is one about the broad and diverse potential of the erotic in the 16th century. Rather than simply dismissing or avidly reading Renaissance erotica as erotica, we can instead explore what cultural work it might be doing and consider what and how it is made to mean. As Nash himself says, out of the filthiest fables may profitable knowledge be sucked.